Hello and welcome to episode 95, part 2 for May 2020, the Space Exploration Show. We shall fight it in B&Q, we shall fight on Apple TV and Disney+, Plus. we shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength on social media, we shall defend our immune systems whatever the cost may be, we shall fight it in the parks, we shall fight on Uber Eats and Deliveroo, we shall fight in the supermarkets, we shall never surrender, and thus we face our own enemy every bit as terrifying and lethal as the Luftwaffe or the Red Army. Rationing rickets, nightly civilian bombing raids give way to the great toilet roll drought of 2020 when we're forced to stay inside watching television and the horror of having to spend all our time with our own children. To be fair, we do have to admit that despite a plethora of streaming services that the children of the Blitz could only dream of, once you've watched The Morning Show and Tiger King, you're just left with a thousand channels of shit. During the 1665 plague, Isaac Newton decided not to rewatch all five seasons of Breaking Bad on Amazon Prime in favour of developing calculus and trying to stop Leibniz getting the credit. Samuel Pepys refused the lure of celebrity benefit concerts on YouTube in favour of diarising the Great Plague and rogering his way through the servants and housewives of the City of London. So we're expecting great literature and science to flourish from all these idling great minds. But I'll be content with the realisation that celebrities on YouTube should be putting their hands in their deep pockets rather than building their public profile by asking the poor and financially struggling to yet again open their pockets to fund services that governments praise but are unwilling to adequately fund. But what am I thinking? Accusing tax avoiding wealthy narcissists of self-promotion in the guise of altruism? I'm forgetting the horror they're going through too. There are people in Malibu and Chelsea that are without quinoa for God's sake. Uh, calm down mate, calm. Calm. Thanks, mate. However well or badly you're coping with the isolation and stresses of this pandemic, know that it is a fight and a fight worth fighting for our own sakes and the lives of loved ones. Stay safe, stay strong, consider others, and let's have fun in the meantime. I'm Ralph, your host for this month, and joining me is the man who's just invented the general theory of relativity and is hard at work trying to stop Einstein from getting the credit, Paul. That bastard German. And the woman who has made it her life mission to find the remains of Carol Baskin's second husband, Jen. God damn that bitch! <laughs> <laughs> oh, if anyone hasn't seen Tiger King, they need to watch it. I, I've not Everybody's seen. Everybody's in lockdown. Of course, they've seen it. I, I've no <laughs> idea what Paul. what you're talking about. Have you not seen it, Paul? <laughs> You, you two keep talking about it. I have no yeah, idea bitch. what you're talking about. Uh, you need to get with the programme. Like, you really do. You need to see it. <laughs> like, there's no two ways about it. Like, it's going to be one of those shows that will go down in history as one of the most bat shit crazy things that... Anyway, so, um, I've got a note in the script here that I don't know what this is about. What's Café Scientifique? On the 21st of May. That's me. I'm giving a Ooh. talk online with Ooh, Cafe Scientifique on the 21st uh -oh. of the month, which is in like a week when this goes out. So, I am. So yeah, tell, they us, tell us what me Cafe Scientifique is. Um, so Cafe Scientifique is, I think, a bit like Pint of Science in that, like, scientists, you know, right across the board of science. So you know everything from like biology stuff to like acoustical stuff like anything that can be remotely classed as science and um, they do sort of short talks on and normally it takes place in a cafe or a bar but um yeah. obviously not at the minute um <laughs> so they've now gone for the cyber cafe scientifique and um it'll be a talk given by zoom um on their website so i think it's streamed via youtube and on their website but i've got to kind of iron out the how, how it all works a little bit later in the month um, because this has literally only just been arranged in the past couple of days um, so I'm going to do a half an hour talk on uh, astronomy things, so things that we can't see with our eyes but we can see at other wavelengths so it's kind of following on from the special segment that we're doing um, in the show now but because it is a, a general science talk it will be at quite a a low level so if you are interested in trying to get some more people into your hobby of astronomy maybe my talk will be a good level for them because it is really hmm. going to be pretty basic because it's not aimed at astronomers it's aimed at anyone who has a general interest in science cool so is this something to watch live or to see yeah, on youtube so it'll, afterwards kind of thing? no it'll be on live and then it'll be available to view afterwards as well so uh -huh. it is i believe 7 p.m on the 21st of may um is the kickoff where time. do they go 
Um, but yeah, if you just Google Cafe Scientifique, um, it'll come up. My blurb should be up on the website now. There's also um, an event for it on Eventbrite um, for for my talk. So so yeah, it'll be about half an hour, the actual talk, and then there'll be some time for questions afterwards. Cool. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so turn our attention to emails. Just one I want to... Um, to read out oh, no, this, this show one. Uh, this one oh, and no. this is from our good friend Mark Grundy in Los Angeles who emailed us about the Welsh room if you remember from mm. I think it was last month's show um, there was a, a, a room in an American university that I couldn't remember that was in a kind of Welsh fashion and Mark says dear Martians and Jen in a recent episode the subject of a Welsh room at a US university came up not unsurprisingly, the Martians didn't know where this room was. The funny thing is, I was actually there in 2007. I just couldn't even remember which city it was. <laughs> the Welsh room is at the Cathedral of Learning in Pittsburgh, <laughs> and they are called nationality or culture rooms. I, I think the, the Welsh one is a nationality room rather than a culture, uh, culture room. That's my comment. Not sure, surely it's a principality room. to say something there, Ralph. <laughs> sure, surely it's a principality room. It's not a nation. I would have thought so, yeah. What yeah a, con a, co a conquered nation. Yeah. People should know when they're conquered. That's all right. Absolutely. We'll, we'll just keep when, all of when our When the English water. did it, they did it properly. Mm. Um, he goes on to say, Ralph is okay, Paul is acceptable, but luckily Jen makes up for it all by being stunningly beautiful, sexy, stylish, and amazingly intelligent. If only we could clone her. Do the Martians have this technology? Just joking, love you all. Interestingly, though, Paul now has as his Twitter handle acceptable i now have my twitter handle as okay mm. and and jen you didn't go with yours <laughs> no, I find as it was before although if we could clone me that would be great because one of me could just binge netflix all day and then the other me could do my thesis that i need to do yeah well if we had twenty five thousand of you or something like that then imagine what we could do with all those twitter accounts just imagine how much spamming we could do mm. oh man be able to take over the mm. world exactly anyway um mark goes on to say i look forward to your episodes love the news love the monologues and enjoy the cursing please keep it up especially the cursing who would have thought that you could laugh so much while listening to an astronomy podcast i know we can't believe that either <laughs> best wishes mark g Okay, that's enough stuff and nonsense. On to the meat of the show, the news section, which, if you haven't realised by now, isn't about inspiring or educating your feeble minds with the endeavours of your more intelligent humans in space, but actually giving you hope that one day, one day, you might rise above the polluted and now diseased bonds of Earth to reach out among the stars where superior beings belong, and one day, maybe, just maybe, join us in the beautiful, brutalist bunkers of Mars. So, Jenny... What have you got this month? Oh, sorry, I just burped. Hang on. <laughs> well, we're breaking news here. <laughs> Jenny Belch. <Belch. laughs> oh, sorry. It was it was all coming out as you were like, so Jenny, I was like, oh shit, I'm not ready. <laughs> yeah. My first news story should have you two quaking in your four little Martian boots. Because China's makes coming us quake. to get you. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. the Chinese. Oh, okay. China uh, has released the name and the logo for its first Mars landing mission. Oh, it won't succeed. Mm, well, we'll see. We'll see. Only the Americans have. I, oh, you're taking away my news story, Ralph. Shut up. Oh, sorry. I'll oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's going to be called Tianwen 1, and it should be launched in July, of course. Uh, whether it will still be launched in July or not with everything going on, who knows. Um, but it's going to be a robotic mission, and the name translates as Questions About the Heavens, which I thought was quite nice. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, it is China's first mission to Mars, and they're not messing around. The mission is an orbiter and a lander, and a rover pew 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 mm. all together the three biggies job done if it does launch in july it'll arrive at mars in february 2021 and it's going to study the martian atmosphere um and contribute to the continuing search for life on the red planet the rover is expected to work for at least three months which means it'll probably keep going for about a decade if it if it <laughs> lands if the mission is completely successful it means that china will be the second nation ever to deploy a rover on the surface of mars 
And uh, as Ralph uh, rudely pointed out earlier, taking away my story, <laughs> all the rovers <laughs> on Mars are actually American. So, yeah. They won't land. Well, we'll see. Either way, <laughs> the, I think the logo is pretty neat. Um, it's basically a bunch of nested blue seas, where the C stands for Mars, I presume. I don't know. Representing the orbits of the eight planets, and then there's a small artist impression of each planet kind of scattered over all of the orbits, and the Earth's even got the moon. Oh yeah, I've just googled that. That is nice. It yeah. is a nice logo. I mean, I gotta be honest, it doesn't really have a lot to do with Mars, but no. I'm wondering if it if it's kind of an indication that they're not just planning to go to Mars, they're planning to go to other places. With, I think they are. With their, you know, Tianwen one, two, three, four, mm-hmm. five. Who knows? Um, Have you noticed also that they've done a futuristic version of NASA's The Worm as the font? I didn't know. I they've didn't ripped off NASA's that. The Worm. Mm. Ooh, Trying to rip something off? Never. Yeah, but then, you know, the, all, all the worm... That, yeah, but then all the worm logo stuff not. is probably made in China anyway, right? <laughs> yes. Made in China or the intellectual property was stolen in China. Ah, uh, little column A, little column B. <laughs> <laughs> anyway you know that i can hardly go an episode without mentioning my favorite multi-billionaire richard branson i mean funny you should mention that <laughs> it was his fault that we dropped out of the live episode <laughs> well oh, it Ralph was, yes. anyway <laughs> um, yeah virgin yeah Media there you were bastards. there you were and there was a little at the window and who should be there richard f- Branson staring in at you. <laughs> He's cutting, holding, cutting your cable. Yeah. Wifi. <laughs> He's got two bits of broken copper wire in his hands, going, "You'll never have internet now, see?" And then running away. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, away from uh, battering Branson. Battering Brant. No, nope. battering <laughs> Branson. I was going to try and be so goddamn slick with my alliteration, then that failed epically. Anyway, it's time. For musings on Musk. Do, 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 do. I feel like I need to be a new section now. Uh, it's Starlink. Musings on Musk. Musings on Musk, yep. So it's Starlink. Uh, you know. You know what Starlink is. I know what Starlink is. It's those uh, super bright strings of pearls in the sky emancipating millions with access to super fast internet, uh, which is something that would have been actually pretty useful um, a couple of weeks ago when we were doing the uh, the live show. Uh, but, you know, it's simultaneously destroying the dark night sky and also the very science that helped create Wi-Fi in the first place. Um, I have very much a love-hate relationship with Starlink. It is the yin to my yang. Um, but I might, dare I say, about to get a little bit happier with Elon. Dare I, dare I say it? Um, he's actually made an announcement that the Starlink satellites are going to be fitted with glare-reducing sunshades. Um, and this is in line with his promise that Starlink's going to have zero, that's right, listen, zero impact on astronomical observing when they're fully operational. So from launch nine, uh, the satellites are going to be fitted with sunshades made of a dark foam, which is radio transparent, which is presumably so that the satellites can still do their work. Um, and it's described to look a lot like a car sun visor. Um, it's currently unknown whether they're specifically modelled on the Tesla ones or not. Um, but that's it really there's not much more information out there um other than that um but i guess it's a case of time will tell just like dark sat um dark sat was launched with a special coating to try and make the satellites darker it did work to some extent it made um the satellites darker by about one magnitude but it's just not enough basically so maybe these sun visors will do the trick I've he also, is trying, though, to be fair to I the mean, fella. I will you know, say, he doesn't have to give a toss about us, but I he will does. say, he is trying, and also he's also released a statement today as we were recording this, saying that he's going to look at changing the height of the satellites and also their orientation, particularly at dawn and dusk, to try and make them even less reflective. So I've got to be fair wow. to him. You know, he is hmm. he is putting some effort in, or at least, you know, the people that yep. he employs are, are really you know, putting some effort in. So, you know, fair play. We'll, we'll see if it works or not. The thing is, with satellites, you can't just paint them black, right, to make them less shiny, because black is very, very effective at absorbing light, and that means that these satellites will get really, really hot very quickly. Yeah. So, you know, but I do appreciate that he is trying to, you know, live up to his promise of 
Starlink will have zero impact on on astronomy. So fingers crossed, really. Hmm. Paul. Cool. Right. Well, I'm gonna give it all the Elon love now. Is that because people have criticised? Yeah, us yeah, for exactly. Being so Elon it's haters. in the yin yang love hate relationship we all have with SpaceX. The nuanced, mm. delicate, contradictory, complex lo- world we live in, eh? So, uh, mm. well, by the end of the month, 27th to be exact, we should have Americans launching in space from Kennedy on an American rocket. America, Damn. fuck yeah. Eagles, bells, guns and shit. Now launching their own boys and girls with the right stuff on home soil again. Boom. Look at that. Nice. And not even an overpriced Boeing craft inside. No, exactly. <laughs> we will hopefully have, fingers crossed, a Dragon 2 containing astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Beckham lifting off at the end of the month for a flight to the ISS. Now, there are still some outstanding technical issues. Because of course there are. It's commercial crew. There's going to be... Yeah, you wouldn't want to be Doug Hurley or Bob Beckham no. here in this. And a few tech issues. They haven't really been I open know. about what these tech issues are, but it's supposed <laughs> to be with those pesky parachutes that they've had so much issues with. Um, well, they're not that important. Yeah, they, they'll get there. It's whether they'll come home again, you know. Um, but NASA seems to be happy they'll all be resolved from the sort of month where we're speaking now and they're going for it Uh, there's also Mm -hmm. an engine out issue on the recent Falcon 9 launch that Jenny the anti-musk was talking about (laughs) Um, it's um, it's being looked into but nobody seems unduly concerned I mean it's it's got nine engines so one engine out is not it, it's got a good safety record now, the Falcon 9. So yeah. they, it's not yeah. a, a big concern. But there, there was an engine out, and, and that's, that's kind of being looked into. So here we are. Finally, commercial crew is here. Ta-da. Well, it will be on the 27th of Hopefully, March. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> I hope to be talking about a successful mission next month. Though, given yes. the record of commercial launch, uh, we, we could well be going, well, there we go. It's going to be another six months, isn't it? But... <laughs> Um, there we go. Now, sticking with the Musk love. Oh damn! Because frankly, we are throwing all the dogs oh, at that bit. Frankly, aren't we? I'm getting down on all fours and assuming the position this month. <laughs> um, you do know that we will be getting the tax dodging um, Bezos lovers saying, "Why is uh, Blue Origin not getting?" I the will same level fillet Bezos next month. Okay. <laughs> and to be fair, I love Amazon, so you know. Mm. They, I mean, he's getting us through this crisis, but oh. when you do fillet him, could you please ask him to pay tax? I'll ask him to well. pay tax uh, after he's paid me. So, um, this this month, we've got a, a two-for-one Starship news. So, first Ooh. off, we had a catastrophic failure of Starship 3. <laughs> As they, uh, Ooh, when they, they ran a pressurisation yeah. test earlier in April... Not quite as spectacular as the bulk <laughs> head hoofing event we had a while ago, which was spectacular. But nonetheless, an end of SN3's days on uh, on the pad event. It it was one of those things. It was like one of those uh, school um, physics experiments you yeah. get where you show depressurization. It just crumples. It just crumples. Like right, crump. <laughs> and it's like, oh, oh, that'll... Oh, it's going, it's going. Bit, bit of tea cut, <laughs> that'll buff out. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, that, that SN3 is no more. Uh, but as ever, this it, SpaceX live and learn, and it is like watching. I, I keep thinking this with them. It's like watching the early days of the space flight in hyperspeed. It is. You know that. that yeah, it's on fast forward. That that kind of 1945 until, um, you know, the the moon landings and everything. It is like watching that in hyperspeed. You think yeah. where he was with Falcon One not that long ago. Yeah, uh, you're right. And, and here we are now. It's got one of the most safe, reliable rockets about to launch crew and is building the starships. And they, they are getting there because actually, as I said, it's two for one. On April the 26th, so yesterday, as we... As, uh, no. Oh, yes. Well. Yes. Sorry. Two weeks ago, as we were... <laughs> Um, (laughs) as we're not recording this SN4 passed the cryo pressure test that SN3 failed and now moves swiftly on to a static engine test which is expected possibly by even the the, the week by sort of the 1st of May Um, but it's certainly expected by the time this episode's released and if that works we should then see very quickly afterwards a 500 foot altitude test flight where they'll make, you know, do, their, do like the you know the old hopper did, where it, it, the space the star hopper, yeah. yeah. 
Um, if that all goes well, SN5 is not far behind. More engines, greater altitude, greater endurance. Suddenly, Starship looks to be leaping out of the cool billionaire presenter graphics and into reality. It's... So, can I ask, Paul, is that SN4, is that going to be doing that space hopper thing of launching, moving across, and going up 500 feet and then landing again, but doing it with the full stack of I the, believe so. the Starship? I believe so. That That's the idea, that they're, they're going to do this sort oh. of incremental progress with this, that they're, they're, they're learning how to build the thing. Yeah. By build- and then they're going to mass produce it, aren't exactly. they? And it's going to be so- literally Henry Ford churning them out. Exactly, and I think, and you're already seeing that pace. Yeah, exactly. Right now, and you kind of, I'm now understanding what he's doing. I didn't yes. at first. I, 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 failures don't matter because no. you've always got another one. Ready. I will freely admit I didn't quite understand what he was doing at the beginning. I get yeah. it now because he's. You see these failures, and actually, they're just—it's like testing, as you say, like mass production cars. It's like, oh, that one doesn't work. Chuck it, chuck it on the pile. Next one. Yeah. This one. All oh, right. Okay. This one works. And yeah. immediately applying the the kind of knowledge from those failures onto the the neck onto the production line. So yeah, there's been there's been this trite phrase in mm. research and development, in innovative research and development for years that is, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Yeah, yeah. And everybody says it, yeah. but nobody actually does it. But Elon Musk absolutely epitomizes that completely doesn't ma- you, you aim to succeed but if you fail it doesn't matter you just move on to the next thing super fast you've already got the next modules lined mm. up and you're learning from your mistakes as you well, go as proof, it's as proof of phenomenal this, to see. sn3 fails within a couple of weeks sn4 has then passed that test sn5 yeah. is is just behind it you know and it will will all those little increments all those lessons learned all those things will be applied mm. And you can see they're learning how to build these things, and they're learning how to build them yeah. faster, better, and and applying each each all this knowledge. So, yeah, the, the, from what I understand, SN four will will kind of essentially be the kind of star hopper, but the full stack kind of idea that it will it'll kind of bring the the where star hopper was just basically a proof of concept. SN four is the thing. It, it brings the the. SN5 will have three engines, I believe, and so we'll go to a much greater height, greater speed, greater endurance, uh, you know, greater thrust, and all the rest of it. So, so we'll, we'll test you know, the stresses out to a much greater degree, and then that'll just be how they work. It'll just you know, get higher and higher and higher, and eventually this thing will be in orbit, and uh, and they'll be already at the position where they've learned how to mass produce them. Yep, and so. um, I think even when uh, SN3 had a had a failure with it. Not just SN4, but SN5 component parts were actually built. It was just about what they were going to change on them mm. and what, what mm. bits they were going to put in there. Yeah. In those iterations, it, the the pace is just phenomenal. Yeah. It's just a question of whether there's the money to to have these failures or whether they've you know they because because each each failure costs money. Well, it's yeah. a, therein, it's a crap they can't use. Therein lies the going back to Starlink. That's part of the Starlink thinking. Is essentially this is this is one of their streams of income that they they fire all these satellites up there and the they get a stream of income from this internet service. This is this is kind yeah. of a people want to access and use and and so it, it's part of their funding model. Yeah. So uh, it, it's fascinating times, really, really fascinating. Um, mm. See how that goes. So yeah, there we go. There's there's me giving the the Elon the love. Well, yeah. I mean, we've always said it on this show that um, we're more than happy to revel in the failures of any space manufacturer mm. as long as there's not people um, on, on board those rockets when they fail. Yeah. But also, equally, we're more than happy to say, you know, we, we get it wrong when, when we do get it wrong. And Elon Musk proves us wrong a hell of a lot. He does. <laughs> he does. He does. I, I think it's partly we kind of know he's going to probably succeed, but we, we kind of love the, you know, who doesn't love a good spectacular hoofing of a bulkhead into orbit? You know, it's... it's oh, yeah. yeah. Everyone loves a good <laughs> failure. Yeah. We were talking about, yeah. about last episode. Why does everyone love Apollo 13? Because it was a glorious failure. You know, everyone yeah. loves a glorious failure. So, but yeah, yeah this, is, this is great. It's amazing. Okay, so for the main news story this month we want to discuss, we have NASA's plans for a lunar base camp, mm. which are now beginning to take shape. So who wants to take this one away? Yeah, so NASA, going back to the moon, uh, slated for 2024. Doubt it now with everything that's going on. And it'll be uh, Artemis three at that point, right? Which will be the one that will land. You know, they're going to have one that will sort of do a circuit of the moon but yeah this will be the one that lands and now they it's always been a little bit hazy about or oh, what mm. what are they actually going for like what is the point of going back to the moon it's like are they just trying to repeat apollo 
and well now we know it's almost definitely not just you know trying to repeat apollo so um when apollo went you know they did some experiments uh they put some mirrors down they left a few flags great but artemis is all about having a sort of more long-term base set up on the moon right as a stepping stone then to go and explore mars so they've kind of outlined i'd say three main things that they want kind of you know for people to start developing and, and working on and stuff like that so the three main things are they want a lunar terrain vehicle mm-hmm. or an ltv and that is you know for moving the crew around um where the artemis 3 will land they then got a habitable mobility platform which is interesting because this will allow long journeys over more significant distance and we're talking journeys of 45 days that's, that's away from the base, isn't it? That's moving away from the base. So these these are so that's you know incredible. the rover is kind of hopping around in the nearby vicinity. You're kind of you know driving around your local neighbourhood, whereas the Habs mobility platform is for exploring kind of the next country over. Right, mm, that, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, I know it, it's a completely different way of looking at yeah. lunar exploration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Apollo was always, you've got your base, which is your lunar module. You can drive out so far, but only so far that if the lunar module failed, you could get back to your base. It was always, that was your safety point. Yeah. This is turning that on its head and saying, well, we've got yeah. something else that means we can go wherever we want within, you know, 45 days. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it is, yeah, a completely different way of, of exploring the moon. And they're going to be able to mm. find out so much more stuff. Yeah. By you know having their base camp, but then being able to go off on little jollies for a few weeks and and find things. Um. Uh, well, you know, I mean, we've alluded to what the third element is. The third element is then <laughs> the the main base camp where you know everyone will be set up, where the first instruments will be set up. Everything kind of runs from this main hub. But... Yeah, and the, the good news about this is that they're already doing the requests for information. You know, the, the kind of first part in a tender process. Mm for getting the companies to ex- to express an interest in developing these. So it's not just a pipe dream. This is something that they're actually putting money on the table for for, for the plans to do it. And and I think that's the real difference between, I think it was, um, was it Bush's Project Constellation back in the early 2000s that was planning on doing something very similar to this, but it never had the congressional funding. And this time around, they've managed to do it without a huge uplift in congressional funding. And as we know, with the Trump administration, the Republicans just fall into line with whatever, whatever he asks for anyway. So you've only got to persuade a few Democrats to fall in line with this for the additional funding that's needed, which won't be a great amount. So this this is actually this is looking like it's got legs. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing is, I guess, is the Lunar Gateway, right? Mm, so I guess this mm. is the fourth element, which is like away from the surface of the moon. Yeah, and this is what I was going to mention was the, the the thing that caught my eye was this using gateway in this sort of Mars dress rehearsal. So they they've kind of they're trying to answer I think some of the Mars angle critics that have, have looked at the the moon strategy that, that NASA's following now, who have been quite sort of critical of why aren't we going to Mars? Why why, why this sudden focus on the moon? What what isn't this a waste of time? And they're trying to really underline this. This is a a rehearsal for the Mars, not just doing the moon. Yeah, and I think it's the right thing to do, right? I mean, we mm. had this discussion. I think last last year or even the year before. It's mm. like, do we think we should go back to the moon or should we just plumb straight for Mars? And I think going back to the moon is the right thing because if something goes wrong, you've got a fair chance of rescue yeah. a few days away. Something yeah. goes wrong the first time you go to Mars, that's it. People are dying. And can you imagine if astronauts die on the first trip to Mars? Yeah, yeah. I think there's also something um, that's quite special about the moon in that it's nearby and you yeah. can see it and yeah. looking up at something that you know if you put a telescope on it you can actually see craters on there and surface details and thinking man alive this there are people living and working mm. on there it's so much more i think real than if you look at something that's a distant dot yeah. in the sky yeah. that if you train a telescope on it m- majority of the time you can't see anything it's only when it's at a good op- opposition that you can uh, that you can see it uh, see any kind of surface details and most people don't know where mars is so i just i think majority of people looking up in the mm. sky and thinking wow 
there's people on that rather yeah. than there's people up there somewhere but I've no idea where it's yeah. ju- it just captures the imagination that much more yeah it's, it's interesting because yeah the article talks about an expanded habitation capability for Gateway eventually so Gateway getting a lot bigger um, yeah oh, okay. and the graphics are even yeah. suggesting they're this sort of Bigelow style inflatable modules but of course we know that Bigelow is going I say that I was about to say we talked last episode about the sort of issues of Bigelow mm. But the, the the idea is there that you could have this big sort of inflatable habitation module and this would then be used as a sort of dress rehearsal for Mars missions but on the moon. So you could do the sort of much longer duration, yeah. the idea that we put a platform around Mars like Gateway that then yeah. is where you base yourself to land on. So you could then demonstrate all the capabilities and develop the technology and the ideas and, and how the missions would work on Mars before you actually go. And Absolutely, yeah. and it's the right way to do things. You know, it will take more time, but it's mm. it's a much safer, a much more sensible yeah. way to do things. Definitely. Yeah, and it means you can do it properly rather than doing it with a huge amount of risk and yeah. doing it in a. You, you you can't do Mars as quickly as thoroughly as you can do the Moon, and I can't even believe we're having this conversation because the idea of having lunar habitats and people actually living on the moon like they lived on the international space Mm. station in orbit currently is the stuff of science fiction until pretty much i would guess really now when it starts looking real because up until now everyone could just say well it's just like bush jr's plan and bush Mm. senior's Mm. plan and obama's plan it's 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 pie in the sky dreams but it's starting to actually look like a reality now yeah 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 completely Okay, so now we continue with our delve into the electromagnetic spectrum where Jenny will be able to tell us about the people, the telescopes and the instruments that are making good use of the submillimeter and the far infrared part of the spectrum. Jen? Yeah, so far infrared submillimeter astronomy is is a really young branch of astronomy. Um, Serious observations at these wavelengths have only happened for maybe the last 30 years or so and like the really big leaps forward have been only in the past 10 or 15 years and it's because it's very sensitive technology it's very very difficult to build and it is only recently in the past few decades where we've had the ability to be able to build sort of far infrared seven meter telescopes so far infrared telescopes and detectors they're kind of this weird hybrid between like radio technology and sort of more traditional like optical astronomy techniques typically the telescopes might look more like a traditional telescope you know where you've got like a big mirror and it sits inside like a big dome um but the instruments are not cameras like we use for sort of optical wavelengths and typically far infrared seven millimeter telescopes they don't detect light in that traditional way um, really what they do is they actually detect heat using an instrument called a bolometer or they use something called a heterodyne receiver to look at like fine spectral lines. And I know I've just thrown a bunch of jargon at you, so let's let's explore those a little bit more. So a bolometer works in the following way. In comes the far infrared light, it hits an element, some sort of like metallic element, and it raises the temperature of the element, this light incoming from your source this element that's absorbed this light has a resistance and that resistance is very very sensitive to small temperature changes so as the element has absorbed this light energy from your source it heats up in a very very kind of microscopic way this causes a resistive change which we can measure then very very accurately and we convert that resistance change to a light signal of you know whatever we happen to be looking at and so because of that it's very important that bolometers are kept thermally stable so that is that the temperature does not fluctuate unless that fluctuation is because we're looking at something interesting so typically as well they're also cooled to temperatures very very much below the temperatures of the objects that they're trying to detect really to be honest as close to absolute zero as you can possibly get which is exactly why sort of far infrared seven meter astronomy really is kind of a new branch of astronomy because it is only recently that we've had that sort of technology to be able to build such detectors now a heterodyne receiver is more like the radio telescopes that we've talked about before it's a little bit of an abstract concept but what it does is it creates a signal which is close to the frequency of the signal that you're trying to detect 
uh, these then mix together the so the signal that you've created and the signal you're trying to detect and they combine into a new frequency which is easier to detect and read out than just the original signal from the source so it's a bit like interference matching is the sort of thing that you're trying to go for but I think probably the most famous submarine meter telescope is the Herschel Space Observatory. Number one, because I've banged on about it for like the past five years on this podcast. So if you've, you know, if you're a long time listener, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But also because it was the telescope that was launched with Planck, and Herschel used a combination of bolometers and also heterodyne receivers, and it studied the universe at wavelengths of between 70 and 500 microns. So you know, still long wavelengths. And to date, the Herschel Space Observatory is still the largest single mirror telescope ever launched at three and a half metres. Um, compare that to Hubble, who's 2.4 metres across. The telescope was actually when, once the coldest place in the universe. Uh, so that's always a nice little fact. Its detectors were cooled down using um, pressurised systems using liquid helium. And it was actually cooled to just fractions above absolute zero. So yeah, absolutely the coldest place in the universe. But of course, you know, putting telescopes in space isn't always an option. And for submarine meter astronomy, um, suitable ground locations are actually very few and far between. Uh, that's because all the water vapour in our atmosphere means that um, fire and fred submarine meter telescopes, they really do need to get above as much of the atmosphere as possible in order to detect anything outside of our, our atmosphere, because otherwise all they're going to see is those water molecules in our atmosphere. What you have to do is go the traditional route of building a telescope on a mountain like the James Clark Maxwell Telescope or the JCMT on Mauna Kea. Um, that's a 7 meter telescope that's got a 15 meter mirror and again uses bolometers and heterodyne receivers. Now, the great thing with fire infrared astronomy is you can actually do some things which are a little bit more exciting. You can actually use a hot air balloon to do some astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So about 10 years ago or so, there, there was a whole series of fire and fried observations that were done using a big old weather balloon down in Antarctica um, called BLAST, or the Balloon Born Large Aperture Submillimeter Telescope. Two metre mirror. Uh, it operated at three wavelengths in the fire and fried. And yeah, it is as crazy as they sound. They literally strapped the telescope to a weather balloon and sent it up for about a month, about 35 kilometres up, floating above the ice going wherever the wind takes it in Antarctica, goes for about a month and then it crash lands in Antarctica somewhere and then you've got to go and find it and get the data and salvage what you can from the telescope. Um, <laughs> which sounds crazy, but is that it was actually pretty successful. And actually they launched BLAST TNG, which is BLAST the Next Generation, in February 2020. Um, so they're starting to do them again. Wow. And of course the joy of the balloons is you get you know really you get above pretty much all of the atmosphere so all of that water is is not a problem um and if that's not exciting enough how about sticking a telescope on a plane because that's what sophia is sophia the stratospheric observatory for infrared astronomy uh it's a modified boeing 747 um, which carries a 2.7 meter mirror um it flies about 38 to 45,000 feet pretty much as close as you can get to space with a telescope you know that's not in space really <laughs> um, the downside of having a telescope on an airplane is that obviously you know you can only observe for as long as the airplane can fly for which is you know a few mm. hours at any given time but jesus christ mm. it's a telescope on an airplane it's just so goddamn <laughs> cool just it's like if someone was going to say where shouldn't you put a telescope on a boat or on a plane so what do they do they put an air a telescope on a plane yeah i know it's, it's phenomenal isn't it but in terms of the future, because um, the, there aren't any space-based submillimeter um, telescopes at the minute, we did have Spitzer, kind of Spitzer went into sort of the shorter end of the fine thread, but we know that that's been dis decommissioned. Herschel stopped working in 2013 because it ran out of liquid helium, which is what was cooling it. So now the future is for a telescope which is currently called Origins, um, and it's going to be basically a combination of Herschel, Spitzer, um, and uh, JWST, but on steroids. It's like a, a, yeah, a 5.9 meter honeycomb mirror. So the same sort of mirror like JWST, but operating at those, you know, very long wavelengths. So it's going to be, because it's got this big mirror, the plan is for it to be really, really fast at surveying the sky. So taking, you know, images of huge swathes of the sky very, very quickly, but also have very deep imaging capabilities. 
also much better resolution than any 7mm space telescope that we've seen before so and it'll really allow us to probe the very first galaxies and things like that so there you have it 7mm astronomy everything from first galaxies to newborn stars traditional space space telescopes cool. and telescopes on balloons because why not cool cool So now we move on to the questions and answers section, which despite doing a full show of Q&A last month, we've still not exhausted the supply of mm. questions you want answering. So thanks very much for sending them in. So for this show, we return to our good friend, Sean Lynch, who's at Lynch Sean P on Twitter, because this question is very apropos at the moment. And Sean tweets, I know the Hat of Woo segment is long gone, huh. but could we bring it back to address the 5G coronavirus idiocy? Oh. <laughs> Maybe talk about the frequency that 5G operates at and how there have been sources in our environment for all time. Does that mean then, Sean, that you don't think that there's any credence to this conspiracy <laughs> theory that, that 5G is creating coronavirus? God sure damn, this conspiracy. <laughs> Uh, Man yeah, alive. we'll definitely bring back the hat of woo for this. Do, 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 uh, hat of woo. Hat of woo. Um, it's all just a cover up. Yeah. Well, okay. Should we talk about like so? If people haven't heard about this conspiracy, the conspiracy is that five G caused coronavirus. Um, or another version of it is that five G is actually coronavirus and that coronavirus is just a cover-up to get us all injected with the microchips that you know track our every movement and these are masqueraded as vaccinations and um but the root <laughs> uh, and the root cause of this um conspiracy theory seems to be that because uh china was the first to set up mm. 5g and they got coronavirus first uh... therefore it is a whole i all I elephants gonna... are grey, all mice are grey, therefore all mice are elephants. Like, this is exactly yeah. <laughs> what this is. I was going to say, that there is a massive, massive element of racism in this. Oh, Huge. it's awful, isn't Basically, it? Basically, if you, if, if you believe this 5G thing, you're a racist. Because it it <laughs> it is clearly tied up in, just before this all kicked off, especially in like the UK and America, we were... We were deep into this whole should china be involved in our 5g networks and that was all doing the rounds and there was a massive element of, of racism involved in all that discussion clearly um and so this has happened so you've had this this illness that's just arisen out of, of china and so people have, have basically decided that it's clearly sort of evil china doing doing evil things with with 5g and it's just basically orientalism. It's 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 lazy racism. It's its just yeah. I mean, all right. So I know that anyone listening to this is not going to believe this conspiracy theory. But you know, if you have Doris over the fence shouting at you that you know it's it's all a conspiracy theory, um, here are your arguments to explain why. Uh, they it's just uh, yeah I just don't I have no words <laughs> for how nonsensical this is anyway so uh, 5G and coronavirus two completely different things right coronavirus is a virus it's in the name it's a biological thing uh, 5G is just a form of electromagnetic waves uh, they're in the radio microwave range that we've talked about before in the last few episodes they're very very low energy and that means they're non-ionizing. That is, they are not going to damage you. Um, even if you use your phone every minute of every day, it's the exact same sort of energy um, as when we look at the sky, at radio wavelengths or in the microwave, you know, it, the radio sky doesn't damage you, 5G is not going to damage you. Um, now, there have been studies claiming that uh, 2G and 3D, blah, 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 that 2G and 3G, uh, which are the you know the second generation and the third generation of this internet. This was what five G is. It's the fifth generation of of like internet. Um, the the cellular and... internet. Sorry. Cellular internet. Sorry, yeah, cellular internet. Sorry. There's some argument that the past ones did damage to rat hearts. Um, 
but these rats were blasted with radiation levels right much much higher than we will ever experience using our phones and something else people might say to you is but look coronavirus has started in cities and cities have 5g you know what else cities have airports thousands of germ breeding <laughs> factories pass through airports every goddamn day do you know what those germ factories are people you you yeah exactly uh 5g is not going to give you any health problems other than maybe a stiff neck from staring at the amazing high definition that you're now getting on netflix <laughs> on your phone right <laughs> maybe a bit of like repetitive strain injury or something from all the gaming that you're going to be doing um <laughs> And the thing is, right, the powers that be, they don't need to inject us with microchips to track us because they already do it, right? Most people on the planet are carrying a giant tracker in their back pocket. It's called your mobile phone or cell phone for our American listeners, right? It's not the government that you need to worry about. It's all the companies that make money off your data, right? And, you know, you, you have to give up. You, know, you Every hour, you know, you, you give up your data just for the convenience of using Google for email and directions and Amazon for cloud storage and purchasing Facebook and Twitter. You know, it's you're doing it anyway. Everyone's tracking you. You can go on Google Maps and they'll they'll tell you like for the past month where you've been. Give you a little map. Um It was pretty easy in the last month to be fair. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Everyone's been at home, right? All the all the local off license. But look, the whole bottom line of five G and uh coronavirus is that correlation is not causation okay that's the key phrase a great example of this um is the whole length of women's skirts dictates how the economy is doing um it's called the mm. hemline index so you can you can have a look at that and that is perfect you know correlates correlation is not causation it's that you know as women's hemlines in fashion get shorter the economy is doing better that is supposedly what it means it's absolute bollocks isn't it so, uh, to be honest, if people do say to you, I think 5G and coronavirus are linked, let them think it. Because then they're not going to use the 5G, and that means there's just more bandwidth for you. Well, that's all we have for time for this month. Jenny has a thesis to write uh, while Paul... Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to. Jenny has a thesis to no. write while Paul and I have decided to redecorate the dungeon. Times are grim at the moment, but they will get better. And if there's one thing we can tell you that it should give you heart, it's that tests have shown coronas cannot be passed through flatulence. Oh, which is frankly a blessing, otherwise my viral load would outweigh that of the entire population of New York State. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, human blood red or that nice shade of xenomorph acid black for the dungeon heavy petting room. And again, remember to let us know if you like the live shows or not, uh, what you want in them, and just you know, generally any feedback about anything really to do with the show. Sounding like a millennial now, but please subscribe to us on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. Um, give us a review somewhere. Uh, just you know, send us some love. So until next time, it's goodbye from Sidonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod.com or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>